welcome you as you join out as you join us we're going to let everybody file into the room and say hello just as we would if we were doing this event in the museum welcome everybody thank you for joining us this is the fourth of our virtual events in the Jean and John Rowe uh, series, My America, Immigrant and Refugee Writers Today. Um, this series uh, accompanies the exhibit of the same name that uh, opened at our Chicago Museum in November and opened online as well at my-america.org. And at that site right now, you can see stories from writers from 18 different countries talking about family, connection, influence, and what it means to them to write as an American. So my name is Allison Sansoni. I'm the program director here at the American Writers Museum. If you like the kinds of online programs that you've been seeing from us, you can become a member and get advance notice of special programs and offers, including book clubs, special behind the scenes virtual tours, and lots of other good things to keep you busy during this very strange time. Our YouTube channel um, under the name American Writers Museum has videos posted of programs from the past three years. You can check that as well for news and updates, as well as our website at AmericanWritersMuseum.org. Our book selling partner when we're open and here online is Seminary Co-op Bookstore. And you can order from online from them or from our bookshop.org page as well. We're grateful to all of you for being here and for valuing the present, past, and future of American writing. Our guest for conversation tonight is Aaron Barbara Strain. He's a professor of politics at Whitman College where he teaches courses dealing with food, immigration, and the US-Mexico border. In the 1990s, he worked on the border as an activist and educator. He's a founding member of the Walla Walla Immigrant Rights Coalition in Washington State. His most recent work, The Death and Life of Ada Hernandez, tells the true story of a Mexican teen mother journeying through the U.S. immigration system and the obstacles she faces there. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you, Allison. It's great hey. to be here. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm I'm eager to talk to you about the the book. I you know I just finished it myself, and so you know when we first meet Ada, you know she's on the brink of death from a, a vicious attack, and the story moves you know backward from there. What was your first meeting with Ada, and what did you find compelling enough about her story to decide to make it a book? Yeah, sure. Um... Yeah, so, uh, you know, I had a long connection with the U.S.-Mexico border. I had worked there. Um, at a certain point, um, after doing work um, in writing about Mexico and other, other, other contexts, I really wanted to be back on the border just because um, one thing that falls out of the news a lot, um, especially when it's focused on border crises, is just there's a beauty and a richness to life in the borderlands. Um, folks who are living their lives across um, borders and cultures and languages. And I just wanted to be in that place. Um, at the same time, I knew that the borderlands have, for the past almost 30 years now, been set up as a sacrifice zone um, to our worst national fears um, and instincts. Um, and so I really wanted to go to the border uh, and try to understand how people were living their lives amidst that, 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 that contradiction. Um, and so early on in the process, um, this, a, a woman named Rosie Mendoza became one of my key guides to Douglas. And Rosie, um, probably someone in the audience has met her. I'm, everywhere I go in the country, I meet people who, who have met her and just been just blown away by her. And she is a, a badass formerly undocumented social worker who works with people going through domestic and sexual violence on the border. Um, and she became my, one of my key guides to Douglas, Arizona. And she eventually um, uh, said, you know, over breakfast one day, actually, she said, uh, there's, this, there's this young woman, a client of mine, who uh, eventually became a friend. And I, I can't tell you anything about her story for privacy's sake, but I'm going to tell her about your work. And if she wants to call you, she will. And if she calls you, you should talk to her. Um, and so it took a while uh, for us to finally meet, um, but to kind of cut it short, we met um, in the 10th street park in Douglas on a wintry day. And we sat next to the fountain 
and uh, Aida told me her story and yeah, I had not at all planned to write a book about what, um, and much less to put violence against women at the heart of a border book. Um, but after talking with Ida that day, um, I realized that she had such a powerful message um, for those of us who look at the border from a relatively privileged position. Um, and that um, you cannot understand what's happening on the U.S.-Mexico border. We cannot understand the U.S.-Mexico border that the rest of us have created without under, uh, separate from the way our approach to border security makes women's lives less secure. Uh, on the border. Um, so, you know, and from there, the, the, uh, that was our first meeting and Ida told me her life story, not the whole story, um, part of it. Um, and from there, the hard work began of, of talking about whether and how to write a book and, and then really diving into what would become a four year collaboration uh, on, this, on writing this book. What, what comes through very clearly in the book is the way that the system works against um, immigrants, both documented and undocumented, and in a way that it doesn't against more privileged people. Tell us about some of the pitfalls that Ida encountered that someone with, say, more money or more legal savvy or more familiarity with, you know, with the, the immigration system, say, wouldn't have faced. Sure. I mean... To, and it's not even just uh, the immigration system, it's, it's um, the experience of life in general is that, um, you know, she is an active member and a maker of her community. She's, she's fully a part of this community and yet she's denied real legal membership in the community and she's cut off from the kinds of rights and um, opportunities that a lot of people would have growing up, whether that was um, the ability to kind of participate in after school um, activities when she was in grade school. Um, uh, but, but, the, but the key thing is that, you know, in the space of her, of her growing up in Douglas, Arizona, Douglas um, becomes one of the most heavily policed small towns in the United States because of Border Patrol strategy that has essentially channeled uh, a continent's worth of migration right into the deserts of, of southern Arizona, the most dangerous territory on the border. Um, to the point where, um, you know, by I think 2014 or so, one in seven employed adult men in D Douglas worked for law enforcement, right? So this becomes a homeland security company town. It's hyper-policed, it's over-policed. Um, and it's the kind of place where, you know, just the small everyday kind of dumb mistakes one makes growing up, like any teenager anywhere makes, um, are, gonna, are gonna have a huge price. Um, and whether that's, you know, something like arguing with um, your boyfriend's ex on the street, um, which in this case ends up uh, setting in motion, you know, a stupid little argument with a, a, with a boyfriend's ex sets in motion a, a really catastrophic string of events. Um, and so, um, yeah, how, how do you navigate that? that world in which every mistake is, 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 every choice is so high stakes. Mm -hmm. The, the book really grapples with, you know, with a lot of trauma. Ada is, she's the victim of violence in at least one case, she's the perpetrator of it as well. And so how do you, how did you handle giving your readers a character that wasn't, you know, I think there's this hunger in, you know, especially among white readers for a, a, an immigration character who, does, who has a clean story, who has a sort of happy ending. You know, you talk in the book about the need for the perfect person, the perfect candidate. How did you handle um, navigating that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that was really important to me from the very start, that this was not going to be a book about a, a demon or a saint, um, but that it was going to talk about a messy, ordinary, brilliant, kind of flawed human life. Um, and it's really hard to, un it's hard to overestimate how much of our immigration debates in the United States, even our sense of the United States as a nation of immigrants, how much that turns on this impossible binary between, you know, on one hand, the, 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 the kind of quote unquote innocent, high achieving, perfect, flawless, 
good immigrant um, who maybe deserves sympathies and rights. And then on the other hand, the, the quote unquote bad criminal alien who deserves all the punishment she gets. And so much of our immigration conversation turns on uh, kind of pitting those two characters against each other. And it's for immigrant rights movements that I've been part of, it's a, it's a major struggle as well, because you know that you can win rights for a select group of people by playing to that external idea of the good immigrant, right? This is the Harvard valedictorian neuroscientist undocumented person. Um, but most people, um, their lives do not fit into that neat, clear binary um, between the quote unquote good immigrant and bad immigrant. So I wanted to write a book that expanded the boundaries of empathy um, to think about the ways in which folks who don't fit that, that perfect, uh, innocent, high achieving stereotype of the good immigrant are also fully members of their communities, active makers of their communities and belong um, here in, in, in their communities. Um, and so that was a crucial piece of, of the story, uh, or a crucial piece of, of the project. And I think the politics of, of the project um, is very much about trying to do away with that impossible binary. And that in, in many ways, it's not something that I came up with, you know, that's following the lead of particularly young immigrant uh, organizers um, who have really uh, stood up to reject that impossible good immigrant, bad immigrant binary and try to build a movement that um, is about belonging uh, for a much broader uh, spectrum of people. Yeah, that, that's a very fine line to walk as a writer, um, you know, to, to not clean it up, to, to not present something that is not the true story. And you mentioned in the, you know, in the, at the end of the book that you, that you and Ada worked very carefully, you know, worked very closely together to craft this narrative. Were there times when she resisted your probing? Were there times when you, you know, when you wanted more than she would give, you know? or vice yeah. versa? I mean, one of the big commitments I made at the beginning was that um, that Ida would read drafts of the manuscript and that she would get, you know, be commenting on it and shaping, and shaping the narrative. And that if she ever, you know, in the heat of an interview said something that later she realized, oh, I, I didn't want to share that, um, that I would just take that out. Um, and in the end, um, there wasn't anything like that. And I, I just, it, I can't express how courageous Ida is about putting her life out there um, and really seeing the power of, of, of a life that's real and how a life that's real and flawed, but yet heroic um, as she is, um, can, can move and transform people. And in the end, I think it's, it's far more powerful um, than if it had been a kind of cleaned up, good, perfect immigrant uh, story. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This isn't the first time that you've um, that you've written about border issues. So did the did writing this book make you reconsider anything that you about your previous work? Did it make you see anything in a different light? Um, I mean, I think again the 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 importance of of breaking out of that good immigrant, bad immigrant binary um, was really reinforced by this story. And all the people I met um, uh, really understood the, the, the damage that that does, right? I think about like um, a meeting, uh, talking with um, kids who have DACA, right? Who in some ways fit the, the vision of the good immigrant. Um, also understand that like by playing the good immigrant, bad immigrant, right? you know, we're not criminals, they're criminals. Well, the they're criminal is often their parents, right? So that the good immigrant discourse ends up throwing, you know, in, their, in this case, their parents under the bus. So a lot of people rejecting that and just kind of seeing that um, the importance of that really comes centered. Um, really also um, just, this is something I knew before, but, but really hit home how important it is to think about the borderlands as this rich, important site with its own history and culture um, that really transcends the, the drama of immigration and cartels and um, smuggling that, that is why we see the borderlands in the news today. Um, and a lot of, of reporting on the border treats the borderlands just as kind of a backdrop 
for that drama of immigration and cat and mouse border patrol chases and and smuggling and things like that um, but really diving into the history um, and the kind of what matters to folks on the border. Um, and I think ultimately that was crucial because I don't think I would have understood how people in, in a town like say Douglas responded to the steady militarization of their community over 30 years without understanding some of that, the earlier history, um, for example, of um, the, the, the kind of the deindustrialization of their community during Reagan era anti-union um, campaigns that really left the, the small town um, economically, um, um, eco economically depressed in a similar way of like, you know, a downstate Illinois community that has lost its you know, washing machine factory. Uh, in that way, Douglas isn't that different from many other places in the country, even though it has this unique border um, location. So really trying to understand that. Um, so that the dynamics were similar. You know, I, I was struck by that, that, you know, the, the rhetoric used to divide the town um, re that really came on the heels of, you know, this economic depression that affected everyone somehow mm -hmm. wound up being blamed on only the Mexican migrant workers. And I thought that was so, that was, you know, this, you're talking about, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, how different is it than the rhetoric that we're hearing today? Right. I mean, and the, and the rhetoric today on the national scale is also different from the rhetoric in a border community, you know, like Douglas, which is 85% Mexican American. Um, and you see many divides, you know, I think, again, trying to not stereotype the border. Um, once you get up close, you see that, um, right, you know, uh, m most of the Border Patrol agents in Douglas are Mexican American. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the mayor who's a, who's a kind of character in the book, who's very anti-immigrant, anti pro-immigration um, restriction is Mexican American, right? So thinking about the ways in which this community is divided as well. Um, and a big part of that has to do with the fact that a vast border security industrial complex has been created such that, you know, a town like Douglas um, depends on se uh, security spending for, uh, to keep restaurants going, um, to, um, you know, the, the city budget, um, you know, the Douglas High School Mexican American kid who graduates and looks out at her town and sees the Border Patrol is kind of the only job in town that has good benefits um, and a, you know, a, a sense of purpose. Um, so really understanding the way that that border military industrial complex um, has transformed communities. Yeah, yeah it was a, it, it really, you know, struck me while I was reading the, the effect on everyone yeah. in town that that this has had and that in telling the full and complete story, you're you're finding you're not finding the stereotypes. You're finding a lot of human beings who are trying to live their lives and trying to figure out how to do them you know, the best, I, you know, I do most of all. Yeah. Are, is there more room for that now, do you think, with, the, with increased fo focus on the border or has that regressed? Are we, are we looking for easier things? Huh, that's an ex excellent question. I mean, I think the, the terrain has shifted for sure. Um, I think right now, you know, something that wasn't really on the radar when I began writing is, is the, the mass exodus of Central Americans fleeing the, the kind of the US sponsored drug war um, in Central America um, and the way that that has um, become the next big um, crisis on the border. I, you know, I think when we say border crisis in that context, it's a little bit of a misnomer, right? Because what we have is a crisis in Central America uh, but then we're making much worse with our current policies uh, on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, but I think, you know, that is not, um, that is not uh, something that I was grappling with. Um, and I do think that has changed the way we're, we're thinking about um, border crises at this moment. Um, so I think there's, uh, there's some interesting space for complexity in thinking about asylum seekers um, coming from Central America right now. Um, whereas my book is primarily um, about, um, you know, undocumented folks who are maybe, um, who are coming from Mexico for the most part, um, and kind of 
blurring the, the, the different shades, which are artificial to begin with um, between asylum seeker and um, economic refugee. Mm -hmm. I see a, we've got a couple of hands up. Um, I'm, we're, uh, we are going to take questions in a few minutes. Um, if you do have questions, um, please type them into the, the chat window at the bottom um, and we'll call on you that we'll contact you via the chat and call on you that way. Um, just wanted to remind folks while we're while uh, while Aaron and I are talking. So you know, you came to this story, you know, having done having done work in this area before, but you also came to it as a white man. Yeah. Were you concerned about the question of cultural appropriation of somehow trying to give a voice to something that had already been told in its own voice? And how did you negotiate your responsibility as a writer alongside that identity? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is something that, um, I mean, I, I, I thought about this all the time throughout the process of, of the project. Um, this, is, this is the thing that kept me up uh, at night through the project um, and still kind of, it's, I'm still learning and trying to figure this out. Um, and um, I, because as you say, you know, I knew coming in as a, as a, as a straight white man um, that there were all kinds of ways in which I could, you know, misunderstand, misrepresent um, um, the stories I was hearing, um, appropriate them for other purposes. Um, and I actually struggled a long time about whether it was even possible to write a book like this ethically from my position. Um, and a lot of back and forth um, with Ida. Um, Ida was very committed to the project um, through the whole thing. Um, and, you know, she would say things like, you know, Aaron, I have already dealt with the worst possible people you can imagine. Um, you know, this project is something that can be part of my healing and a way to, to make a difference in the world. So I, I did feel like there was something really important and a reason to tell the story. Um, uh, and so how do you then navigate all those potential fit pitfalls? Um, and, you know, I, it's not for me to say whether I did it well, um, but what I, what I set out to do um, was, first of all, that um, I wasn't just kind of parachuting in, right? I had had a long, long experience in, um, in Mexico and on the border and working in immigrant rights advocacy. Um, it's something that I've been connected to and care a lot about and did, doing the research um, the second is making it as, as collaborative a process as possible, um, which is that, you know, Ida would be reading drafts throughout the project and shaping the narrative. Um, and we would be talking about key aspects of the book together. And, and that extended to her family, um, um, friends and other people who appear in the book. Um, and then trying to make it community based, right, really drawing on the connections I have on the border, people who are in border activist organizations, um, border community leaders, border community groups um, to get their uh, pushback and feedback throughout the whole process. And then really just um, throughout the whole project, engaging with scholars and activists of color, particularly women who can understand, yeah, the benefits of a project like this, but also the risks of a project like this um, at a really immediate level. Um, and it was the feedback and, and the critique and really the encouragement that came out of that process that, that made me think like, okay, yes, we, we can go through with this. And one of the first questions I would ask folks often um, was simply like, should I publish this? <laughs> um, fully expecting to hear the answer no. Um, and it was the kind of encouragement that came out of that um, that moved the, the project forward. Um, for me. Um, so again, I mean, I still, I feel like I'm still learning these uh, about how to handle questions of representation um, and the kind of ethical pitfalls of this project. But, um, you know, that's kind of what I, what I, what I, how I tried to navigate it well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, you know, asking activists, particularly women and women of color, what the, what the risks were in, in a project like this. What did they tell you? Yeah, I mean, so there's there's levels of risk, right? I mean, there were um, the possibility of of a kind of re-traumatizing in the storytelling. Um, Ida talked with her therapist throughout the project about um, about the idea uh, and kind of came to the conclusion that telling the story was healing. Um, but there is so there is the risk of re-traumatization. Um, there's the risk of 
of, of, of kind of exposing Ida um, to, you know, the, the awfulness of, of the internet, for example, um, and kind of hateful folks. Um, and that's, you know, in the end, uh, we went back and forth for a long time about the use of pseudonyms and, and ended up with pseudonyms um, primarily um, for the privacy of her family. Um, and, um, and then there's kind of, um, you know, uh, luckily Ida and her family are in a good position now in terms of their documentation status. Um, so that was less of a, of a concern. Um, but, and then there's a risk of kind of reinforcing kind of negative stereotypes or, or, or doing harm through the kinds of, you know, we've definitely seen books about the border that reinforce certain kinds of stereotypes of the, of the border as um, this kind of essentially violent place full of these kind of crazed macho men. I had at one point in the process, uh, a reader associated with publishing, not my editor, my editor was fantastic, um, but said something like, like, um, Aaron, can't you make uh, Agua Prieta seem more sinister, more like the Sicario movies? Um, and, you know, so kind of really like having to work against um, a lot of the stereotypes um, that treat the border as this kind of essentially violent um, or treat, I mean, kind of one thing that I, 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 just, I worked with a lot with uh, kind of scholars and activists of color was the, like, how do you write a story in which some pretty violent and awful men do some pretty horrible violence in this book um, with and doing justice to that without like uh, reinforcing stereotypes that like Latino men are that way, um, which are kind of the dominant ways in which uh, our culture understand, um, uh, say, violence on the border um, or Latino um, inter uh, 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 intra-family violence. Um, and so, yeah, trying to kind of write the violence um, that was real to the experience of violence, but also putting it in a larger political and historical context to see that, like, if the border is a violent place right now, um, in large part, that's because of direct policy choices by the U.S. and Mexican government. It's not about a kind of a central culture of the border. Um, so trying to draw out that history um, and that politics was was crucial to to being able to situate the violence in the story. You, you did a, a Q and A with um, with Nate King, who runs our uh, runs our blog about the um, about and one of your you know you mentioned during that Q and A, which is on our website um, at AmericanWritersMuseum.org. For those of you that are um, that are following along with that, we um, you know you mentioned just how long those stereotypes have been with us. Yeah. And, and I found, can you, can you talk a little bit about that in your historical research? You found some of the same stereotypes going, you know, back a hundred years. Oh yeah. I, I, I remember reading um, dispatches from journalists writing about the border around 1916. Um, and they're using very similar tropes to that you see in, in, um, you know, Netflix series about the border and also serious journalism about the border sometimes, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, um, Oh, what is it? The, the, the vacant eyed uh, refugee child um, was a trope in that 1916 uh, writing. Um, the, the wily border bandit, um, uh, the savvy cross cultural uh, worker who can slip across both sides of the border and cultures with ease, the fixer, as it were, um, the kind of um, the the, the the lazy cantina that has that you know has deep secrets, um, and I think I, in that Q and A I said something like uh, you know the border sometimes uh, comes across like the bar scene in Star Wars, um, and that that characterization <laughs> has been around that long, and, that and it's been around that long, yeah, yeah, and um, and part of that is just trying to how do you do justice in writing about this place to the fact that it is a really unusual and unique place where people are living their lives across all kinds of borders. Um, mm -hmm. um, they're living their lives across language and across culture. Um, there's, you know, all kinds of like physical relocations where, you know, people are moving from one side to the other. And, and so lives are complicated and interesting in this space, um, mm -hmm. but you don't have to then kind of exotify it. Yeah. 
Yeah. What what has been the the reception of folks in in Douglas and and of people who you know who are mentioned in the book? What has been that re the reception to the book? Have they felt that you've done it justice? So yeah, early on in the or soon after the the book came out in hardback, um, I had a, a series of book events. I, had, I did a book event in Bisbee, which is a town um, about. Uh, 30 minutes from Douglas, just off the border in Arizona. I did an event in Douglas, Arizona, and I did a, an event in Agua Prieta, Sonora, on the other side of the border from Douglas. And I was terrified. Um, you, I mean, you cannot imagine how terrified I was to take the book back to uh, these contexts. Um, you know, when has it ever gone well that, like, the, the writer, journalist person came back to the small town he or she wrote about and like people loved it. Um, so I was pretty terrified going in. Um, and, but what I found was that, um, that uh, it, it was actually, it was, it was, uh, it was just moving uh, how uh, people received the book where like the question and answer period, a good chunk of the question and answer period was people standing up and talking about how um, they feel like their town is never portrayed as a real place. It's just a backdrop for all this other stuff, you know, Fox News stuff. And that for the first time, they felt like the, the history and the and life, everyday life in their town had been portrayed in a real way. And I mean, that was, you know, anything else that happened with the book, you know, that was a, um, enough. You know, that was just such a profound um, experience. Um, and then individuals affected by the book as well. I mentioned Rosie Mendoza, who I've always thought of as kind of a hero. She's this badass. And yet she wrote me a text early on um, after she read the final book where she said, you know, like, sometimes I doubt myself and my work and like being able to see myself through this book reminds me of how what I'm doing matters. And it allows my kids for the first time to really see um, what I do. Um, so that kind of stuff. Another moment with, with Ida wrote about how it, very confidently she said, you know, I always knew that the book was going to make a difference in the world. <laughs> um, but what I hadn't known uh, was how much it, of an impact it would make on my own life. Um, and knowing that people, you know, I've been sharing lots of emails from readers um, who are talking about what a hero she is um, and kind of how that has, being able to see herself through readers' eyes has really um, given her confidence and abilities and um, a sense of, 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 of healing um, is, I mean, it's just, it, it, it floored me. And it's, um, uh, you know, I think it's the most important thing that's, that's come out of the book. Um, yeah, so I've I've just been really um, moved and uh, blown away by by the kinds of reactions. Or you know, yesterday I got an email from a professor friend of mine. It was a forwarded email from a student of his who's undocumented, young undocumented woman, and they had read the book in their class. And she said, you know, I felt like it was about my own family, and I was seeing my own family as a hero in this story. Um, and so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> It, that that feels really good. Yeah, we we have a few uh, a few questions that we'd like to to have people ask. So our first question tonight is from Russell. Hi, Aaron. It's Russell in Seattle. Um, oh, how you doing? Good, good. Um, I have I have three questions. I'll make them brief. Um, the first one is, um, I assume the book has been translated into Spanish, and if so, what has been the reaction on the Mexican side of the border? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Russell. Uh, well, you know, if there are any Spanish language publishers out there listening, um, <laughs> I would really love it to be published in Spanish. It has not been published in Spanish yet. Um, okay. I'm really hoping that that will happen soon. Um, and I'd be curious to see what the reaction is also because, um, you know, there's, uh, I won't, there, I won't give a too, there's a lot of twists and turns um, and thrills and spoilers in this book. I don't want to give too much away, but um, a, a plot line that runs through the book is about um, Mexico's guerrilla movement in the 1960s. Um, a person who was heavily involved in that, his life intertwines with Ida's in a key way. Um, and through that, it allows 
the book to talk about the fact that it's not just the United States making the border unlivable and militarized, uh, but Mexico uh, itself has a key role in the militarization of the U.S.-Mexico border. So right. we'll see how people respond to that. Okay, good. Um, I found the book to be one of the most personal stories that I've ever, I mean, I felt privy to this amazing woman's life and her family. I feel like I know them. And so my second question is, Aaron, do you know how they're doing today? How's Gabriel? How's Ida? Are, are they surviving Corona? What's, yeah. you know, what do you hear? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, we talk frequently and um, I can tell you, I mean, it's kind of want to protect identities, but um, uh, Ida is in a much better place now than she is at the end of the book. The book ends where she's in a very difficult position. Um, and she has, um, she did eventually have to go into the New York City homeless uh, shelter system, um, but ended up in a, an amazing uh, family uh, shelter um, that provided um, therapy and social service support and housing stability um, for a good chunk of time that allowed her to finish her GED. Um, and with her GED, she was able to get um, uh, uh, accepted into this very competitive program um, for LGBTQ peer uh, mental health counselors. Um, that's just amazing and has had, I think, this really transformative effect uh, on her life. Um, and she's gone through that program. Her internship for that program was disrupted by um, the coronavirus. Um, but um, I, I just, I feel like um, things are, you know, I, it's always up and down and, and there's always kind of things happening um, and trauma is never over. Um, but Things are, uh, she has kind of been able to uh, kind of take this next unstoppable heroic step in her life. And it's really cool to see that. Great, great. Okay, quick last question. Movie rights. Um, I, I value this book tremendously. I'm the adoptive father to two Latinx boys, one from Central and one from South America. I think to have this story, a la Brian Stevenson and Just Murphy, just mercy to have it on the big screen would bring your book to such a huge wider audience. Is there any thought about that? Yeah, I mean, actually, there is. Um, there is. There is a two producers, uh, two Latina producers, um, uh, who have the the option on the rights um, and are working away on that um, with the idea of a of a, of a limited series. Um, for Netflix or Amazon, one of the streaming services. Um, and um, one of the producers is, uh, is Mexican American from, the, from a border city, an Arizona border city, so really gets the story. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. Uh, I would say that there's probably a 99.99% chance of it not happening just because that's how those things are. Uh, but you know, that 0.01% is great. I'll take it. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Russell. Our next question is from Sonia. Yes. Hello, Aaron. Hi, Sonia. Hi. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to read your book yet, but I'm curious to know how your book can be used as a teaching tool across the academic disciplines. And also, if there's a, a learning activity, particularly written based, that could be good for students, for instructors to use in their classroom. Oh, interesting. Great question. Thank you. Um, I mean, I know that the book is being used uh, in classrooms ranging from uh, English, English, uh, English classes to uh, political science classes to anthropology, uh, a lot in uh, Latinx studies. Um, so uh, I, I think it really can be used well. Um, and part of me, I'm a college professor also, um, so I, uh, I wrote it in some ways as, as the kind of book that I would want to have for, for teaching. Um, and I think, um, you know, an appeal to the book is that it weaves together Ida's story with the kind of history of how the border came to be this messed up place that it is today um, and how it could be different, um, right? So it's, it's very important that the book is not just about 
um, Ida's story, but it's Ida's story in the political um, and historic um, context. Um, and that's not just because of teaching and, and, and um, uh, you know, uh, the educational aspect of that. Um, it's also, I think, crucial because empathy isn't enough in the end. We talk a lot about the value of empathy in reading, um, and I do think empathy is powerful, and it's a huge first step for action often um, to be able to care about people across difference. Um, but if it's just empathy, then it ends. And it's kind of like, well, I felt sorry for Ida and, and that's good. I did my thing by feeling sorry. Um, but uh, by having that political context, that historical context, it allows students or other readers to reflect on the ways in which um, we've made the border, right? Those of us who are relatively privileged in this story have made the border what it is today. We've made the border unlivable, or at least it's been made that way in our name, supposedly to keep us safe. Right, so having the history and the politics allows us to kind of place uh, readers to place themselves as being complicit in making the border um, the way it is today. Um, so, yeah, I, I would love to. I would love, and if you do end up using it, I would love to. Please write me. I, I'm happy to Skype into classes, and I'd love to hear how it goes. Um, I think people have used uh, kind of personal, uh, personal memoir reflection kind of essays. Um, um, particularly uh, in classrooms with many um, immigrant students um, have used the kind of narrative memoir assignments in relation to the book. Thank you so much. Um, we did get one question here, Erin, that I'd like to like to read. Um, you suggested, for, it's from Janet, you suggested that your own rejection of the good immigrant, bad immigrant dichotomy was informed in part by the activism of some young immigrants' rights activists. Mm -hmm. And um, she'd like to ask, could you expand on this? Are there organizations, books, moments that you would recommend as indicative of this awareness on their part? Yeah, I mean, and I think that's really important that it's uh, to just make clear that it's not me inventing this. Um, you know, this is something I learned um, through both reading kind of critical scholars of immigration, particu particularly Latinx scholars of immigration um, have um, kind of in the academic realm done important work um, critiquing this concept. Um, uh, uh, but also organizations like United We Dream and the Immigrant Youth Justice League um, have been really uh, formative um, in, in, in powering, putting forth that powerful message that it's not okay to just um, win rights for a very few people um, by throwing, um, you know, so-called criminals under the bus, um, you know. Um, and, I, and I would add to that, you know, one piece that doesn't get talked about as much um, is it's when, when you kind of have the good immigrant, bad immigrant winning rights for some in, in, at the ex, in expense of more criminalization, more punishment, more detention for others. Um, it's not just about the immigrants. Uh, it's also about border communities getting thrown under the bus. So many immigrant, uh, so many immigration reform proposals of the past have said, well, we'll give rights for you know, certain undocumented immigrants, but in return, we're gonna further militarize. We're gonna pump more billions of dollars into militarizing um, border communities. Um, and I think this is, we also need to kind of reject that narrative that throws border communities under the bus uh, in return for paltry uh, or a, a small amount of rights for a, a small group of people. What are, so, who are some of the historical writers that, uh, about these issues that you read? Uh, let's see, historical writers. Um, I mean, there's um, uh, uh, St. John's book, uh, Lines in the Sand um, is great. Um, uh, Benton Cohen's, uh, oh no, I'm, I'm one of those people who blanks when asked to name books and movies. Um, let's see, um, you know, I did archival research for the project as well, um, looking into Douglas archives and the archives of, of environmental movements around the copper industry in, on the border. Um, there were some great um, uh, border memoirs written by people back in the, in the 50s. Um, kind of border history memoirs uh, back in the 50s. Um, I'm a big fan, I think I mentioned this in the Q&A, a fan of uh, Américo Paredes, 
um, who is a, a Texan, a Mexican-American Texan uh, folklorist and novelist um, who does an amazing job of capturing uh, both in nonfiction and in fiction um, the kind of complex um, world of land conflicts and racial conflicts um, on the U.S.-Mexico border. I think he should be part of, of the, the key canon of, of, I mean, he is but even more so part of the core canon of, of U.S. writers. Mm -hmm. You, you know, he's, he's mentioned in, he's featured actually in our inner museum as one of, as one of the, the 100, we have a timeline of 100 writers who sort of represent, you know, people who really were emblematic of major moments in American yeah. literature and he's one of them. And so okay. I was so pleased. Thanks that you mentioned him because we feel very proprietary about everyone in the, <laughs> in the <museum. laughs> sure, sure. but hopefully, hopefully more and more people will, you know, will become familiar with this work. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question from, is it from Paul or from Bonnie? I have both names up here. Okay. What I found particularly heartbreaking in the book was the challenge of convincing women like Ada that the, the abuse they accepted as just a part of life was not appropriate and, and you know, resulted in a kind of post-traumatic stress for these women trying to figure out how they can appropriately respond to situations. It's so sad to think, and I think you went to a Harvard psychiatrist or something in, it was mentioned in the book, cons consulting with someone uh, about this. And, and this particular professional said, yes, these women are experiencing post-traumatic stress mm. because they think husband puts his fist through the wall and misses their face barely is a part of life and, and it's not. And so I, I really appreciated your focusing on that and, and bringing that out in the story. Right. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, I think that was, um, you know, that was not something that I expected to be a key piece of, of a border book. Um, and as I said before, realizing the more I got into it that you can't understand um, the way our policies have unfolded on the U.S.-Mexico border without um, understanding the way it's made. Um, it's, it's increased violence against women on, on multiple different registers, which is not to say that all violence against women on the, on the border um, comes from immigration policies or drug war policies, um, but certainly the uh, U.S. policy on the border uh, benefits from and, in fact, um, uh, nurtures uh, violence against women in, in all kinds of ways. And it is, and, and um, whether that's, you know, in the case of, of domestic violence like this, right, there are several times in the book where different abusive men say, sure, go ahead, call the police. You know, mm -hmm. if you call the police, uh, this is where the, the abusive man is documented and the, and the woman is undocumented. And, you know, go ahead, call the police. You know, if the police come, I'll get a slap on the wrist. But, you know, in Douglas, the Border, Patrol, <laughs> the Border Patrol is listening right to the, to the, the police channel and they'll come and uh, they'll take you away, right? Using that kind of threat. Right. Um, yes. And also, you know, in terms of, um, you know, if you watch the, the kind of, Narcos type movie or Sicario, um, you get the impression from that genre of TV that like um, uh, cartels uh, exploiting women on the U.S.-Mexico border are the enemies of the U.S. government. Um, but if you look at the strict terms of the U.S. government strategy on the border since 1993, which has been to make the border more dangerous, more deadly, more difficult to cross um, in order to supposedly defer uh, migrants, leading to thousands of deaths. I mean, if you think about that as the U.S.'s central strategy, explicit strategy since the 1990s, um, cartels uh, abusing people on the border are actually allies. Mm -hmm. they're, they're force multipliers for us, right? They're kind of like... Um, We've outsourced some of the worst um, violence uh, on the U.S.-Mexico border to dangerous cartels. And then we act shocked um, mm -hmm. at their behavior. So, yeah, and it is, to, to get back to your question, it is very much uh, a post-traumatic stress uh, dis, uh, syndrome. Um, or even uh, people talk about uh, complex PTSD um, be, when, in, when you're talking about people who have been exposed to various forms of violence and trauma, 
of, of multi, in multiple different registers, kind of the structural violence of poverty, abuse within the household, uh, incarceration of family members, the way that all kind of uh, accumulates and sediments into a very uh, complex form of, of PTSD. Yes, yes. Thank you, Bonnie. Erin, what, uh, what are you, what is your next project? Is it another, um, is it another border book? What are you working on right now? You know, I'm, uh, at the moment, I'm just kind of trying to survive the process of, um, of, uh, of promoting this book and trying to get the word out as much as possible. Um, I think, you know, I put so much kind of sweat and blood and tears into, into this project and, um, you know, in the little window that we have, I'm going to try to get out there and, and, and promote it. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the next project is. Um, there's some interesting stuff about um, uh, immigrant rights movements that have emerged and immigrant rights mobilizations emerging in more conservative small rural towns, um, like where I live, um, I think doesn't get a lot of attention on the national scene. Um, mm -hmm. I've been thinking about that. Um, I also have a strange little project I'm working on about uh, Mylar emergency blankets, um, which has become the kind of icon of refugee status, of climate crisis, um, and thinking about in the and a kind of militarized humanitarianism, right? So the and and the project is called um, All Warmth. Um, uh, wait, I lost it. Sorry. Um, all heat and no warmth. Um, so thinking about the ways in which this blanket is an emblem of a kind of militarized um, care uh, for refugees and um, people affected by climate change. Um, so little, little projects I'm working on. I haven't quite figured out what the next big project is. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for, for being with us tonight to share this project. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me and thank you all for, uh, for attending. All right, everybody have a good night and we'll see you at our next program. Thank you.